We look forward to hearing from the Attorney General about his vision for Kentucky and what he would do uh, if elected to be the next governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Please help me to welcome the Attorney General, Andy Bashir. All right, good afternoon. If y'all had had half of the coffee that I've had today. Good afternoon. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, as many of you all know, I grew up in Lexington and Winchester. Uh, I'm a graduate of Fayette County Public Schools, and I'm really honored to be here with you at your last luncheon, uh, I believe, of the season. Um, I have loved serving as Kentucky's Attorney General. It's given me as much purpose uh, in life, so much purpose in life, uh, along with my family and my faith. I've gotten to wake up every single day and to fight for those uh, that have needed our help the most. And I'm proud of the work that we've done. Now, we have ended Kentucky's rape kit backlog. That means we have tested every single kit. We're one of only two states that can say that. And we now have 10 indictments coming out of this backlog to make sure that we get justice for people who waited too long. We've tripled the number of child predators we've removed from our communities, making them safer for your kids and mine. We arrested a record number of human traffickers last year and saved a record number of victims. We've returned over $2.5 million to seniors that had that money scammed from them, and we have returned tens of millions of dollars to our Medicaid program, dollars that we were defrauded on, your tax dollars, to make sure that that system is solvent. That fight. That fight that I've loved every single day for our people is why I wanted to run to be your governor. And I'll tell you, around the Commonwealth right now, I see a special type of energy. I see an energy that brought out 200 and, and 200 odd people in London, Kentucky on a Saturday morning at 8.30 a.m. We had so many people show up, they closed down half of the Golden Corral <laughs> and we ran out of coffee cups. We were at Salyersville just the other night, about 8.30 p.m. on a Monday night. There is a lot our families are doing at 8.30 p.m. on a Monday night. I know I have a nine and a 10 year old. We had 250 people show up to hear our message. We were in Sturgis just last night with a room full of folks that are excited and that are ready. It's a type of energy that I haven't seen before, but I will tell you I'm not surprised. Because what I hear from our families over and over is that they feel left out and left behind by this current administration. And I don't think they're asking for a lot. They're asking for a governor that listens more than he talks. I think that'd be nice. They're looking for a governor that solves more problems than he creates. As Attorney General, I know that would be nice. And they're looking for someone that would never engage in bullying or name calling, but instead spends all his time addressing the challenges in front of us. And folks, that's the type of governor that I want to be. One for every Kentuckian, Democrat, Republican, Independent, Eastern, Western, Northern, and Central Kentucky. But I will tell you, I want to be the type of governor like I've been the type of Attorney General that also fights for the lost and the lonely and the left behind. That makes sure that every single child in this Commonwealth has true opportunity regardless of the cards they've been dealt. And that, folks, is a very different tone than we've been hearing coming out of Frankfurt. We cannot survive another four years of an administration that constantly divides us, that tries to create an us versus a them. Now, if you go back to his, his fancy farm speech, he got up there and he started yelling, which side are you on, which side are you on, and even gesturing. Are you on this side? Or are you on that side? Are you on that side? Or are you on this side? Growing up in Kentucky, growing up not very far from here, I know our challenges are too fundamental in this state to have one side and another side. I know our challenges are too pressing to have an us versus a them. I know in this Commonwealth we must and can only have a we, and we can only move forward together. So I hope that you look at this election and you see it bigger than some battle of Democrats versus Republicans. I know I do. Everywhere we go, we see Republican support, and it is welcome. Because at the end of the day, all we want to do is move Kentucky's families forward. And the challenges we're focused on, public education, pensions, health care, and jobs, they're not partisan. They're just good for every Kentucky family. 
And this race is about what's going on in your house, not what's going on in the White House. But someone who is afraid to run on their record may try to make it about the White House. And I believe that this race is about issues that matter to all of us and not about right versus left, which we hear about in cable news every single day. But I'll tell you something. I do think this race is very fundamentally about right versus wrong. I believe that when a governor attacks our teachers, calls them names, tries to tear down a system of public education, it's wrong. I believe that a governor that puts the health care of 95,000 Kentuckians on the line and threatens everybody's coverage with the pre-existing condition, I think that's wrong. I believe a governor that fails to create jobs all over the Commonwealth, because 82% of jobs that have been claimed to be created have been in just two cities, and yes, we're in one of them. And yes, I want to create jobs here, but we deserve to have good jobs all over Kentucky in every single community. I think his work there has been wrong, too. And I believe that a governor that has failed to address a drug epidemic that we must stop in our lifetime, that's wrong, too. And I'll make an admission to you. One of the reasons that I ran for governor is I felt like I had to stop any more wrong from being done. That I looked around my state that I love, that I've tried to serve my best these last four years, and I believe that I had to do this because I thought another four years would be devastating. And you have seen the last four years that I'm not afraid to stand up to anybody when I think they're doing the wrong thing. It's one of the honors of my lifetime to stand up for every teacher, police officer, firefighter, and social worker when this administration tried to illegally cut their retirements and worse, put it in a sewer bill. That is wrong to do to 200,000 people that we don't pay enough and serve our communities, teach our children protect our communities and serve the neglected. But I think my first test of courage in this job came before that. It was 90 days into my term as AG. And those of you who work around Frankfurt know that 90 days in, you're still trying to figure out where to park and where the bathroom is. That's 90 days in, less than three months. But 90 days into my term is when this governor illegally cut the budgets of all of our universities and community colleges. 90 days in. And I will tell you at that time that those who try to give political advice, and there are a lot of those, they were saying you can't do anything about it. They were saying this governor just won by 9% and you just won by a landslide of 0.1%, or 2,201 votes. 2201 is my password to everything. <laughs> you can all watch Netflix on me tonight. But it was a really important moment for me because I got to look at myself in the mirror and remind myself that I didn't get in this for me. I came from a good profession and a good job. I'd worked hard to get where I was. I got in this for every family, one paycheck away from falling into poverty. And when we live in a state with the third lowest per capita income in the country, which means we're the third poorest, far too many of our families are there. Most of our families even live below an income level that's needed just to meet your needs. I got a friend named Laura who is a Fayette County public school teacher. You may have seen her on TV recently. Who has to drive an Uber after she teaches just to make ends meet. I think that's wrong. I got in this for people like Laura and everybody else who's struggling, who needs a government that works for them. So you know what happened. I filed that lawsuit. We won it. We returned $18 million where it belonged. And I think that I showed this governor that we would not be bullied, that the rule of law mattered, and he had to follow the rules just like everybody else. So yes, one of the reasons I got into this race was to stop a lot of wrong. But I want to be your governor to do a lot of right. You know, this is a well-kept secret, uh, but I think you spoiled it. I know a former governor pretty well. Steve Bashir still takes my phone calls. In fact, he calls me way too much. I try to give them to his grandkids. That's not working right now. And as much as he has been attacked and maligned by this governor, I will tell you he's been the most wonderful father, and he is the best grandfather I could ever ask for his two kids. And I think we should honor the service of our governor and first lady after they're done, instead of attacking them after eight years of dedicated service. But because I got to watch him, because I got to see him and his term, I'll tell you this, I know what this job isn't. I know this job won't make me any better. And governors who believe that fail like this one has. 
I know it won't make me any smarter and that I'm going to need to be listening to the best ideas that are out there because the best ideas come from outside an administration. Sometimes the most important thing you can do is listen and say yes. And I know, according to my wife, that it won't make me any better looking. So I'll just work with what I have. But what this job is, is an amazing opportunity to wake up every single day knowing you are in the best position of anybody in this commonwealth to truly help people. And that your days in the job are fleeting. I know because my term as attorney general is about to end and I've loved it every single moment. I think about the day that we rescued the very first human trafficking survivor when I was attorney general, the Wednesday before Derby in 2016. And I know that there are fewer days that I have left to make sure we do important and critical work uh, like that. So I don't just want to be your governor. I want to govern well. But sometimes people may want to ask, how do you govern well? I think that can be pretty simple too. How about we all just follow the golden rule that we're taught on Sundays, that we're supposed to practice the rest of the week as well, that we treat our neighbor as ourselves. It's a way of saying that we owe everybody respect, decency, and dignity, that we don't just work for people who agree with us or people who are in our political party. And just because someone disagrees with you doesn't make them your enemy. The government, like so many other things, has conflict. It's about conflict and compromise. And if you react with anger towards conflict, you're not going to be a very good uh, governor. So here's what an administration is like, I believe, that follows the golden rule. First, it works to fully fund public education, every school, and every school system. So I'm a graduate of this school system, would not be here today, but for Fayette County Schools and our teachers. I believe in our teachers so much I selected one as my running mate. And at this time that we are in right now, it's important for you to know that Jacqueline Coleman will be the first active educator since Martha Lane Collins to serve as Lieutenant Governor. I think that's awfully important. It's about making sure that the next budget doesn't do what this governor did to the last one, which is eliminate funds for technology and textbooks. Our kids are having to compete not just with Indiana, but with India, and we must give them the resources. And then we must shrink our class size. And I've given you a plan of how we're going to do it. It's on andybashir.com, and it basically tells you that this is my top priority, that every budget we start with is going to focus first on K-12 through and higher education before we reach what's next. That a budget is always a values document, and I'm telling you ahead of time what our values are. An administration that does right by its neighbors protects health care. That's why I'm fighting the federal government and this governor who are trying to tear away coverage for pre-existing conditions. It's personal to me. When I look at my family, it's my wife, Brittany, my son, Will, and my daughter, Lila, and three out of four of us have a pre-existing condition. I bet that's the same in many of your tables and tables all across Kentucky. So I have a plan out on andybashir.com, which will not only put that critical protection into state law, but talks about how we're going to lower all of our health care costs. Because no matter how much money you make, you all pay too much for health care. It's about using the buying and leverage power of the state in a way that New York did. They woke up about a year and a half ago and said, wait, we're one of the largest purchasers of pharmaceuticals in the world. And they started putting that into action and saved a billion dollars on their drug spend in the first year. It's about forming the type of advisory board that Maryland has that's meant to address that EpiPen situation. So no one can ever buy that one critical drug and skyrocket its prices. And it's about holding people accountable who are gouging us. And I sue the three largest makers of insulin because it costs $7 a vial to manufacture. And I talked to a 12-year-old the other day in Moorhead whose parents have to pay $1,000 a month just to keep her alive. I believe that's wrong. And I'm going to fight for a state where no one ever has to ration their insulin ever again. I think doing right by our neighbors is about creating jobs, but not just any job. It's good jobs. I believe that Laura ought to be able to teach and raise her family based on what she makes. That the jobs we create ought to be jobs where if you work hard during that week, you can raise your family working just that one job. And so our jobs plan is about something that I don't think this governor offers you, and it's vision. It's about how we can invest in areas that can make us not just a national, but an international leader. It starts with agritech. And if you, like the governor in the debate the other night, want to know what is agritech, 
It's everything from the science and the seed before it goes into the ground. We see flooding, we see drought. Our seeds have to be able to withstand it. It's the data analytics because in a world of changing weather patterns, we're not only scrambling at our utilities, but it's more and more difficult to know when to plant and when to harvest. It's the technology on the tractor that helps you uh, go in that perfectly straight line, which increases your yield, and it's that drone that you now use because you've got to manage an acre and not an entire field. Folks, we've got to increase our food supply 70% in the next 30 years just to feed the world's population. And that's why there was an 80% increase in investment in agritech just last year. Only Iowa is currently investing the way that we ought to be investing in. And if we can combine what we already do in farming with the technology of the future, we can be an international leader right here in Kentucky. Those are six-figure jobs in everything from the science to the manufacturing to our universities, and they can be all over Kentucky and not just located in a couple places. Our plan's about advanced manufacturing because every day automation eliminates a job on a line, and we've got to make sure there's a job waiting for them. Between robotics, which our public schools are already do doing such an amazing job with, we've got kids that are building robots that can't even drive a car, though I think the robots can probably drive the car by this point. But if we want to continue to be a manufacturing leader, we must lead in the design and the engineering and be producing the technicians of the future. And it's about health care. Listen, I believe health care is a basic human right. It's also one of the largest growing portions of our national economy. And we proved in the last administration that we can be the gold standard for health care. When we created Connect and expanded Medicaid, we did things the federal government couldn't. It was a feat of technology. Our, our marketplace, our website worked on day one. The federal government's crashed. We did in Kentucky what they couldn't do in a place where they print money. It was a feat of logistics. We had the largest decrease in our uninsured population in the entire country three years in a row. We knew how to get to and sign up people. And if you see the studies that are coming out right now, one is on colorectal cancer, it shows you that it's working. We're going to save money in the long run, but more importantly, our friends and family members are going to be here longer to share their time with us, that we will create a healthier workforce, and that once we address both our education and our health care challenges, I believe the sky is the limit for us. We must address this drug epidemic. 30 Kentuckians a week. That's what we lose. People you know and people I know. That 100 babies being born every month going through withdrawal, and if you haven't heard that sound, it's not meant to be on this earth. I've been working hard as Attorney General in everything uh, from our work with opioid disposal because so many medicine cabinets are filled with pills that can easily addict someone to making sure we hold these international opioid companies accountable. I have worked hard. This should have been an area where everyone in government could work together, but it hasn't been. But I can promise you this. We win this race. We will get our efforts back on track. I will make sure that Kentucky has the very front row seat in any national talks, because if I can leave any legacy to my 9 and 10-year-old, I want it to be a safer world. I mean, it was just in front of the Opera House on Broadway about three years ago uh, that I had to help drag an overdosing man from a car. And I actually watched him stop breathing for three minutes, right in the middle of traffic, stop both ways. And I didn't know how many different shades somebody turned as they died. Now, thankfully, EMS and, and EMTs were able to revive him with Narcan, but this is what we're facing at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday. And just the next day, one of my investigators made a save in a McDonald's drive through at 11.50 a.m. in Carter County. We can and we must do better, but folks, the only way we do all this is together. The current administration is going to continue the politics of division. I'm going to do my best every single day to bring us together. It's about changing the tone. It's about realizing we wake up every day, not as Democrats and Republicans, but as moms and dads, as members of a community, as someone who has a job in an industry that's really important to them. We have so much that unites us, especially the fact that we are all Kentuckians. I believe that we can all come together and we can do special things. But to do that, I need your help. I need your vote. I need your support. And I need you to talk to other people about it because we are 18 days out of an election that is going to decide so much about the next 40 years. I'd ask you to side with decency. I'd ask you to side with dignity. I'd ask you to choose a vision of where we go in the future and look for the candidate that shows you the plans on how we're going to get there. I really appreciate you all having me today. 
I know each and every one of you are a pillar in the community, not just in your business, uh, but in your private and personal lives. Thank you for all the causes that you work to help and you work to help address. I promise you this, I will run a state capital that no one is locked out of ever again. But instead, the doors are always open for your ideas, for your input, knowing that we are stronger uh, because of our diverse views and opinions, and we are stronger when we all listen to each other and work together. Thank you all, and I look forward to taking your questions. Hard stop. We've got a hard stop at one. We can go about five minutes longer. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we have 15 people who have asked this question. The pension issues continue to be a major concern for Kentucky's fiscal health in the future. Yep. What will you do to address these issues? First, a pension is a promise. It is a promise that we made to our most important public servants that we don't pay enough. Listen, we have social workers that basically live in poverty after getting college and advanced degrees that dedicate their lives to serving uh, the neglected. This governor went in front of our social workers and called them an unskilled profession. I strongly disagree. It takes more skill to do what they do than what just about any of us do. They are amazing people. We don't pay them enough. But we made them this promise that if they dedicate their lives, because you have to give decades to earn a pension, decades of your life, that we would promise them a solid retirement. And I'm going to keep that retirement. This governor only has two ways he wants to address it. Number one is illegally cutting benefits, which we stopped him. But number two, he's now pushing all of those costs down on our cities, our counties, our rape crisis centers, our child advocacy centers, um, our, our health programs in our cities and our counties. And what are our cities and counties doing? They're looking at every tax they can possibly raise. Matt Bevan's way of addressing the pension system is to raise your taxes, but just to make cities and counties do it instead of state government. I believe that it is time and we must look at the new dedicated sources of revenue that we've been missing out on. It starts with expanded gaming because every state around us now, every single one, has a form of expanded gaming but us. That should be casino gaming. It should be sports betting. It ought to be treating fantasy sports for what they are and paving the way for online poker because it's coming. In casino gaming alone, we lose $550 million of tax revenue to Indiana, where they can pay their pensions or pave their roads, uh, to Missouri that has um, uh, Metropolis, a casino right across from Paducah, to Tennessee that just legalized sports betting, and you can go one foot into Tennessee and spend your entertainment dollars on your phone, and they get a cut instead of this state. It's time to push it forward, and any legislator who would tell you in the heat of an election that they're not going to work with someone from the other side if they're elected, Folks, you shouldn't accept that, and that's not going to be the reality when we show up in January. Second piece is medicinal marijuana. I didn't get here lightly. I'm, I mean, I'm the top law enforcement official in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. But I believe we're going to prove in our lawsuits that while opioids have a place uh, for uh, acute pain, and certainly those that are in end-of-life care, they do not work for chronic long-term pain. I believe we're going to prove that. And if that's the case, what have we been doing? We have been stocking medicine cabinets with highly addicted substances that aren't ultimately providing the long-term relief to the people who need them, but what they're doing is causing addiction. I believe that this is a way that we can lessen the flow of opioids, that we can uh, ultimately uh, generate uh, some revenue, but we can also give uh, some chronic pain relief. Uh, third way is I think we've just got to be wise about how we use our state tax incentives. I mean, we ought to have a vision for where we want to go and how we invest them. Let's make sure we're using them in the industries of the future where jobs will exist 30 years from now in a rapidly changing economy. And let's realize that it's got to be an investment every time we make them. That if you make an announcement like Interblue and Pikeville, and in your numbers you include hundreds of jobs in it, and a hundred million dollars of investment, and it was never going to happen. And yes, they just announced that it wasn't happening. False hope in a place that doesn't have enough hope. That's not the way we ought to run our economic development cabinet. And last, we've got to look at comprehensive tax reform, though people throw that phrase out all the time, and it can mean lots of different things, and it's going to take work and time. But while Matt Bevan is offering you no new sources of revenue, I'm offering a vision and a plan of how we can generate much needed dollars, dedicate them to the pension system. That'll increase our bond rating, it'll decrease our costs, and we'll get on the track uh, back to solvency. Next question 12 people have responded to is if elected, 
you're likely to be working with a heavily Republican state legislature. What strategies would you use to work effectively with them? Well, I appreciate that, and I hope that we can start this discussion by acknowledging that the current governor has problems working with his own legislature, regardless of it being Republican. I mean, the difference uh, is, is in part respect. I would never call a special session with three hours notice when I, we have state legislators that live four hours away. Never call a special session without talking to the leadership or talking to other legislators because they have families and they have plans too. But it's time we change the tone. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to lead that way. The bully pulpit was never meant to bully. And when you use it to bully, other people get in on the act too. It's meant to push for better behavior and better tone from all of us. I am not going to take the bait. I bet the day after the election, people are still going to be trying to fight. But the day after the election, I'm a governor for everybody. And if you don't give oxygen to those trying to divide us, you will see a major change in tone. But the second thing I'm going to do is put in the work to build the relationships. Every legislator that wakes up every morning, like I was talking about, you don't wake up saying, I'm a Republican state senator. You wake up saying, I'm a dad or a mom. I've got this project in my community that's absolutely critical to my people, and it's not partisan at all. It's about forming those bonds on where we'd go. And during this election, I think you've seen we can reach across the aisle. I believe when State Senator Dan Simon endorsed our campaign, that's the biggest crossover endorsement we've seen in about three uh, of these governor uh, election cycles. But it's also about making sure that we, the people of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, demand more from our public officials. If they're going to take a stance that is against your interests in your location, you got to let them know about it. I mean, we got to leave our egos at the door if we truly uh, want to move Kentucky forward. And so I know that we, together, can get done what we need to get done in that legislature. Thirteen people have asked, what is your plan to stop personal injury lawyers from filing frivolous claims against small business with the goal of just uh, settling out of court? Well, I think this is a, an ongoing discussion that is happening and, and a discussion that, that can happen. I think that that discussion has to be um, at the base level about frivolous claims. And far too often what we see by the time anything gets to a hearing in Frankfurt is they're asking about someone who was really seriously injured, that something very terrible happened. And the question then becomes about their access to the courts and about justice. Listen, I believe in justice, and I believe our courts have to be open um, to all Kentuckians. And I believe that any law that, that is passed in this area, the lawyers ought to look at you and tell you if it's constitutional before they ask you to get behind it. But the conversation can be had, uh, especially about these blatantly uh, frivolous lawsuits, uh, about how we talk about them together. I believe the plaintiff bar, even when you talk to them, is open to that discussion, but it can only be done by somebody who can bring multiple people to the table. Listen, you can't insult somebody and then ask them to sit down and negotiate. Your business doesn't work that way. If you get out there and you yell at somebody and you call them names and then you say, oh, sit down here and let's try to work things out, doesn't happen. Twelve people have asked, will tax reform be part of your focus as governor? What does Kentucky need to do to be more competitive for jobs and people? Well, comprehensive tax reform is absolutely um, a part of our plans. And that's got to be uh, plans that, that aren't just committees in the legislature working. I remember there was an issue in the last session where um, it was on pensions. They were, they were talking about pensions, and they formed a working group. And they said, hey, we have Democrat and Republican legislators. Wait a minute. There are so many more people, organizations, professions, that are involved in that, in that pension problem. We've got to make sure that when we work on comprehensive tax reform, it's not done by just elected officials in Frankfurt in a back room. You've got to be at that table. You've got to be at that table because no one's ever going to know what's going to help your business as much as you are. And if we don't listen, we could even have the best of intentions and not pass the very best uh, legislation. You've also got to be at the table because comprehensive tax reform is going to be difficult. That's why we haven't seen it enough. And so it's going to take everybody coming to the table, giving it a little bit, getting a little bit, but ultimately realizing that we have an antiquated tax system that we must modernize, not only to compete um, uh, on business, but also to grow revenue in ways uh, that, that should have been grown uh, a long time ago. Uh, so yes, we will engage in comprehensive tax reform, but it's not just going to be in the halls of Frankfurt. It's not just going to be in a couple of chambers. Hopefully it's in a big room like this 
with each and every one of you expressing your views and being an active part of it. Eight people have asked, what specific industry, industries will you target to grow jobs in Kentucky if you're elected? I know you mentioned agritech. I, I believe our, uh, we, we have, we have uh, really four uh, major areas that we've put out plans on. That doesn't mean those, aren't the, those are the only areas. And we are always willing to talk to anyone who believes they've got an idea that will move Kentucky forward. Uh, Agritech, it is a way we can be an international leader. And if we jump on it now, we have got a chance to do something truly special in Kentucky. It's advanced manufacturing, robotics, and AI. It's health care, but it's also tourism. You know, in my race for governor, we have put out a tourism plan because for so many of our communities, it is a driving force for their local economy. And we've got to do better uh, than we are against competing states to make sure that we get as many of our tourists here and then we have to drive them to small businesses. We need to make sure we're taking advantage of so many amazing small businesses, whether they're around land between the lakes. My goodness, land between the lakes is one of the beautiful areas in this country. It can and should compete with Lake Tahoe, but we are not investing in it in the way that we ought to. I mean, I will tell you that I've been going to, to Kentucky Dam Village uh, for most of my life, and we haven't seen a new hotel in the area in that lifetime. I'm not sure we've seen a new paint job <laughs> in that lifetime. We have an opportunity to invest in tourism in a way that can lift up our local communities, but I'm going to tell you, I think we ought to pair it with expanded gaming. When we've got people who are flying in from Europe to go to Eastern Kentucky uh, for ATV trails, for falconing, uh, and, and for other adventure tourism, but they drive to Charleston, West Virginia to stay, we need to look at those ways that, that we can create a true um, uh, resort-type attraction and lift up so many communities uh, across Kentucky. Last question. Quality child care is critical for working oh families and to prepare our kids for success in school, yet child care deserts are common. What will you do? I'm going to work with each and every community to make sure we address this need. Folks, I'm a parent. I'm a dad of a 9 and a 10-year-old, and I will tell you, I've been away way too much in this election. This is one of the hardest things that I've ever done, and it's because I don't see my kids or my wife enough. I didn't appreciate enough the other night until she started talking to me about it, how hard this has been on her, bearing all of the child care uh, for these past six or, or seven months. And, and we're fortunate enough to where she was able to make the decision to stay home with them, and she is still struggling. And think about all of those working parents, all those working single parents especially, who are trying to do what it takes to give their kids a, a better life, many of them working in areas where there aren't enough jobs and working two uh, or, or three jobs. Uh, we have to provide the means of success. We have to look at the barriers that are keeping people from breaking cycles of poverty. Health care is one of them, and we've talked about that. We have 400,000 people that have uh, some form of health care coverage that didn't in the past. If you're not healthy, you cannot maintain a good job and do better uh, for your family. Public education, same way. If your kids aren't getting a world-class education, if you can't trust your public schools to keep them safe and help them with their needs, it is really hard to get your family ahead and child care needs. Uh, we got to make sure that we have uh, the types of, uh, of laws, but also partnerships in place that make sure whether it's that single mother or single father, because we have so many of them out there, especially because of this drug epidemic, or those grandparents. So we have more grandparents raising their grandkids per capita than any other state in the country because of this epidemic. We have to make sure that they have the resources and the help they need, uh, because every child we fail, every child we fail, it's all of our faults. And I hope we believe that that every child we let down, every child that ends up at Maryhurst, where my wife volunteers, we have failed. And we're doing everything we can to help after that failure, but we've got to understand as, 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 as responsible adults, we have a duty to every single child across the Commonwealth. And yes, that sometimes means we have to make decisions that um, we wouldn't otherwise support, that we need to support programs that we haven't otherwise thought of. But just imagine giving every single child in this Commonwealth a real shot at success. We wouldn't have just done an amazing thing for our economy. We'll have done the right thing. And I can tell you this, as your governor, I'm always going to work to do the right thing. Thank you all for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you.